Lecture 4, Product and Service Design and Reliability. So first we're going to talk about strategic product and service design. So the essence of an of a organization is the goods and services it offers. So um, the whole organization should be structured around the goods and services. Um, so product and service design or redesign should be closely de uh, tied to the strategy. So what does product and service design do? So it begins by translating customer wants and needs into requirements. So you can refine existing products and services or you can develop new products and services. Um, you decide what your quality goals are going to be. Uh, you also uh, decide on your cost targets. Um, you uh, construct and test uh, prototypes. You document the specifications and then you translate those specifications into process specifications. Um, and there's a lot of interfunctional collaboration. You need to be working with marketing. You need to be working with operations. You, you have to be working with finance. All, all everybody has to be co collaborating together. So here's some key questions. The first question is there a demand for it? So you're gonna you're gonna sell something. The question is what is that market size, and what is the demand profile? When do they want it? Where do they want it? All of those kinds of um, considerations in the demand. The next question is, can we do it? So, um, you know, is it manufacturable? Um, I one of the jokes that engineers have is uh, that's made out of unobtainium. Uh, it's a, you can't obtain it. Unobtainium. The uh, a lot of times you have a really good idea. You might be able to make one of them but you really can't make a lot of them. Every once in a while you'll see a product being delayed because one piece in the manufacturing process, it, you can't get the quantities up. Serviceability. So if, if it's a service that you're designing, can you provide that service at an acceptable cost or profit? Um, if you're if you're preparing food, can you actually prepare it fast enough to give the, the customers what they want? And can you make a profit? The next question is quality. Um, the quality needs to match customer expectations. You want to think about competitor quality. And then the other question is, does this quality fit with what else you're doing? So if, if you're focusing on fairly low quality, such a, a, a dollar store, um, dollar stores are notorious for, or, or have a reputation for low quality. And then you come in and say, well, I also want to sell this really high quality item at a dollar store. Well, that might not make sense. And then does it make sense from an economic standpoint? There's all the other things like liability, ethical considerations, sustainability, cost, profits, all of those things. So here's the reasons that you design or redesign. So there's some driving force um, that that create market opportunities or threats. So those could be economic, uh, social or demographic, political, legal, 
liability, those kinds of concerns, competitive, cost or availability, technological, all of those are reasons they become drivers to create new products. So where do you get ideas for new products? One, one place is the supply chain. So ideas can come anywhere. It can come from customers. It can come from suppliers, distributors, um, and then employees, um, maintenance and repair people. So the reason maintenance and repair people, they're seeing what's coming back and what's breaking. And so one idea might be to reduce the maintenance by upgrading the piece that's that's uh, needs repair all the time. Then there's competitor base ideas. So suddenly the competitor comes up with some new products or services. Um, so there's many useful ideas that can be generated. Uh, another consideration is reverse engineering. So I ask a question in one of the assignments is reverse engineering ethical? So let's address that a little bit. So reverse engineering is dismantling and inspecting a competitor's product to discover what's inside. So it is legal to reverse engineer. What's not legal is to take something that is copyright or patented and copy it without a license. But it's okay to reverse engineer it and then create something similar. Some companies will actually have one team reverse engineer a product and then translate that reverse engineering into specifications and give it to a different design team to create the solutions. So it is legal um, the question that you will need to talk about is, is it ethical? Reverse um, research-based ideas. So research and development, or R&D, um, so the organization is out there looking for some scientific ideas or product innovation. So there's three kinds of research and development. So there's basic research. This is where you're just thinking about things for the sake of looking for good ideas. And there's no real near-term near expectation that you'll get a commercial application. And then the second is this applied research. This is where you, you actually want to come up with commercial applications in the near future. And then development, development it converts the results of these, this applied research into useful commercial applications. So if you look at this, basic research feeds applied research, applied research feeds development. Legal considerations. So when you're developing a new product, there's product liability. So what happens when this new product hurts someone? Uh, you, you look at a lot, of, a lot of products that you buy, like an extension cord, there'll be this great big huge label sticking off the side of it, and that's all liability considerations. And, um, you know, so what are those uh, li liability costs? There's litigation, there's legal, there's insurance costs, there's settlement costs. Uh, Product recalls, reputation, all of those are legal considerations. And then there's something called the Universal Commercial Code, UCC. And you'll, you'll see on an extension cord, it'll say UCC rated. or and, and what that means is that there's been some level of independent test on that product to, that it's, uh, that it, declares its fitness for use. Ethical considerations. So the first thing is designers, it, it, when you're designing something, it always takes longer than you thought it was going to take. And the designers, the project managers in charge of the design, 
they are always under pressure to get this done as fast as possible. So wanting to speed up the design process and in speeding it up, you may be able to cut costs because if, if you're paying a team, you know, a team that takes one month to design something uh, costs half as much as the team that takes two months to design something. And then there's that pressure of the trade-offs. What if the products have bugs? So um, you can release a product and risk your da damage to your reputation, or you can work out bugs and forego the revenue. Uh, Microsoft is famous for releasing products before they're ready. And, and their focus has been first to market. Um, they're getting a little better about that, but that focus on first to market. It's not just those, the revenue lost, but it's also letting a competitor get ahead in market share. Sustainability. So st sustainability has become a bigger part of design. So using resources that do not um, harm the environment customers are wanting that more and more. Some of the key aspects for uh, sustainability is cradle to grave assessment. So you look at the entire life cycle. The, uh, the little um, coffee cups, K cups, um, the designer of that actually regrets that he designed it simply because landfills are being filled up with these little coffee um, cups, the, the K cups. So, so that's a consideration for sustainability. Is your, what's gonna happen, is your, is your product gonna end up filling the landfill? End of life programs. When you get to the end of the life of this, how's, what's gonna happen? Let's say that you're, you're renting a whole bunch of equipment and then it turns back in. What, what, what happens with that? And then there's the three R's of sustainability. Reduction of the cost of materials, cost of materials used, so you reduce what you're using. Reusing the parts of returned products, so it's you re, reusing them and then recycling. So what you're not using, you're sending to recycling centers. So here's the stages of a product or service. You start at the beginning with introduction, and then it goes through growth. And, and the growth tends to be pretty fast, and then you get into maturity, where the demand is peaks out, and then the demand starts to climb, uh, decline. And the, typically the de decline is because there's a new product that comes along that has, has replaced it. We call that disruptive technology. Standardization. So standardization is a consideration in design. When, if you can make multiple parts identical using in, in multiple places, what that means is your, your quantities can go up, which means your prices can go down. Uh, so every customer receives some item that's essentially the same or, or in a service, it's, it's very similar. Mass customization. So mass customization is a strategy to have basically standardized goods or services and you incorporate some degree of customization in the final product or service. So one example, um, one of my favorite uh, restaurants is uh, Chipotle. Uh, Dos, Dos Bros is close, but we like Chipotle better. So Chipotle is a great example of mass customization. So you have all the pieces there ready to go into whatever you want. And as you're going through line, you start out, do you want a burrito? Do you want a salad? Do you want a, a, a bowl? Do you want a taco? 
and the pieces are all there. And as you're going through the line, they're adding whatever you want. Do you want uh, lettuce? Do you want cheese? Do you want beans? What kind of meat? Do you want uh, tofu? Whatever it is that you want to put into that burrito, it's being customized, but it's mass customization. It's happening as you see it. So one, one method of, of mass customization is called delayed differentiation. So in this case, you, you have it almost done, and then you customize it at the end. So one, one example is you have a piece of furniture produced, a piece of wood furniture, but you do not stain it. You, the customer chooses to stain. Uh, another example might be uh, a builder is building a house and the, the builder is going to, it's a spec house where they're going to um, sell it. They're speculating. Um, a lot of times they'll wait um, on the carpet, on the colors of the walls, some of those things, depending on where, where they are in the process, um, you can have those customized. You can say, well, I want to upgrade the carpet. I want to change this or that or the other thing. Uh, that, that's another example of delayed di differentiation. Modular design. So modular design means that you have pieces of components. So one of the advantages, um, it's easier to find failures because the pieces could be um, you, you diagnose individual pieces. The disadvantage is you, you might not have as many uh, product configurations or limited availability. So an example of modular design is on your computer. So you have a computer. Um, it has a hard drive. You can have different kinds of hard drives in there, but it's modular. You can have different amounts of memory. That's modular. You could even upgrade the processor. So those are all standardized, but you can change it. And, and you can actually use modular uh, design with delayed differentiation where the computer parts are there, and as soon as you order it, they put in the right hard disk, the right, uh, the, the right memory, whatever it is that you've ordered. They put it in and ship it. Robust design. So... A robust design is, is, is a design uh, to operate under broad range of conditions. So, it, you know, you could have a phone and the phone, you cannot put it in water, um, but, but then a robust phone might be waterproof. Or you might have a watch and a robust one might, might be able to drop it. It's it's has wider um, range of operating conditions. Quality function deployment. So QFD. This is um, it's a very specific methodology that incorporates the voice of the customer. So if you if you ever find an organization that uses QFD, it's good to know what QFD is, but you'll get detailed training on how to use QFD. And, and the way it works is over on the left-hand side, you have some customer requirements. You translate those customer requirements into design characteristics. So it's a little uh, matrix where you're you're, um, you're applying customer requirements to design characteristics. And then you create a new matrix over here where you take design characteristics and you, you uh, identify specific components with this. And then the specific components goes into the production process. And the production process goes into a quality plan. So it's stepping through this uh, house of quality sequence. Concurrent engineering is an approach where you bring both the engineering design team and the manufacturing people together early in the design process. 
the the uh, traditional way of doing this is you have engineering design something and then they go decide whether they can manufacture it. Um, another part of concurrent engineering may actually bring marketing purchasing into some cross-functional team. And sometimes you even include suppliers and customers. Uh, the story is that uh, cup holders, the first time cup holders were put into cars were because of customer involvement. So by doing concurrent engineering, uh, you can get designs that reflect customer wants and make uh, manufacturing easier. Computer-aided design. So th this is where you actually use computers to design the system. So the advantages are you can increase the productivity of the designers um, you know, three to ten times. You have a database of manufacturing information um, and you have the possibility of uh, the engineering and cost analysis. The um, computer automated design can include something called finite element analysis. And what this does is actually, if you have gears, you can, you can actually simulate the gears turning, the space between the gears. And you, can, you could actually have design a car and actually have the engine running, have the transmission going, the wheels turning, all of that. That's that finite element analysis. Production requirements. So you have the, the, the whatever it is that you're designing has to be able to be re, uh, produced. So if you're if you're in the um, in the product business or service business, what equipment do you need? What skills do you need to produce this? What kind of materials come into this? What are your schedules, your technologies, special abilities? All these are considerations manufacturability. So this is really how hard is it to make this um, for fabrication or assembly and if it's really hard then it's gonna cost more. It's gonna be harder to produce. You may have lower quality. If it's easy to produce you might be able to reduce cost, um, produce more, have better quality. Commonality. So this is um, a, another uh, very similar to standard parts, but when you have a lot of similarity between parts, if you, if you have different people on the design team, they have choices in parts, if you can start standardizing those parts um, across the product, um, it, it makes it, uh, you can have savings in the design team, you may not, uh, so in the old days of, of cars and, and starters, um, you, you could have the same starter used across multiple models of cars, across multiple years, it's the same starter. And so you don't have to redesign the starter. You say, well, when you're designing the car, well, pick one of the standard starters and put that in. Um, you can have savings in design time. Uh, standard training for assembly installation. You can buy bulk from suppliers um, and then repairs can be easier because you have common parts and fewer items on inventory for repairs. Service design. So it begins with a choice of service strategy. So if you if you think about like a subway restaurant, you the strategy there is you walk through and you tell the server what what you want in your sa uh, sandwich. Uh, other there's some gas stations like uh, Wawa or Sheets, and those those stations they serve very similar sandwiches, but instead of walking through the line, you go up and there's a little kiosk and you type in what you want. You put all your selections there and then you and then you uh, select your order 
and it prints out a little receipt for you. You go pay for your order and then when, then you come back and they call your number and they hand you your sandwich and it's been customized for you. So, you know, that that's an example of, of very similar products um, or services, but a different strategy. So there's some differences between service and product design. So products are very tangible where services are intangible. So services are created and delivered at the same time. Uh, services can't be inventoried. You can't um, save up, uh, if, you, if you're a call center, you can't save up the time that uh, one of the operators is sitting there waiting for a, for a call. Um, for when they get two calls. It, it doesn't work that way. You, you can't inventory it. Uh, services are highly visible to customers. Um, the customers actually see what's going on. And some services have very low barriers to entry or exit. Um, if, you're, if, if you want to wash cars, um, it Let's. If you're a big car wash, that has a fairly large barrier to entry and exit, where you 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 have all of that. But you can also, with a hose and a bucket, wash cars, and with and that's a very low barrier to to entry. All you need is a water and a bucket. A location is an important consideration with service design, especially if you, you're servicing employees. If you're a call center, that the location is not so important. Um, and then there's little customer involvement to very high customer involvement. And then one of the concerns is the, the demand variability. So that can create waiting lines or idle resources. So you have an operation strategy. So your strategy, it, it needs to give you a competitive advantage. Um, you can package products or services to increase sales. Um, you can use multiple platforms. Um, you can implement tactics will, that will benefit high volume while satisfying customer needs for variety, uh, continually monitoring uh, pr products and services for little improvements that you can make. And then the other is to reduce the time it takes to get your new design or redesign to market. Reliability is a consideration in product and service de design. So Reliability is defined as the ability of a product, part, or system to perform its intended function under a prescribed set of conditions. So failure is when that product, part, or system does not perform as intended. So reliabilities are all, always specified under certain conditions. So you have a phone, um, like an iPhone, you, the old ones, you couldn't get it wet. So that's normal conditions. It works unless you get it wet. So there's the reliability go doesn't work when you get it wet. There's new ones that you can get wet now, but normal operating conditions, it may be temperature. I, left my my phone in the car and I came back and and it said it it overheated and, and shut down I could make an emergency call but nothing else it needed to cool down um, it actually had that built in so reliability is expressed as a probability so it's the probability that the system or product will function when you want it to when it's activated and it's the probability that a system will function for a given amount of time. So here's some rules. Uh, rule one is the series rule. So 
um, when you're finding the probability that a system consists of an independent number of components, then you use the probability for the independent events. So rule one is if two or more events are independent and success is defined as the probability that all the events occur, then the probability of success is equal to the product of the probabilities of the event. So lots of words here, but let's jump into the math a little bit. It actually makes sense. Um, so here's an example. A machine has two buttons. In order for the machine to function, both buttons must work. One, one button has a probability of working 95% of the time, and the second button has the probability of working 88% of the time. So then the question is, what's the overall probability for the system to work, both buttons have to work. So it's it's pretty simple math here. It's, it's just 0.95 times 0.88. So you, you, you multiply that out and so 83.6% of the time, this machine with these two buttons will work. I won't want to use this machine only 83%. Um, it sounds like we need some better buttons. Okay, then there's the redundancy um, rule. This is rule two. So one way you can enhance your reliability is to have redundancy. So a great example of this would be the, the power is on 99.9% .9 of the time, but then you have a backup generator. And, and so you know, when the power goes off, what's the probability the uh, generator will work? And you put those together. And so here's the rule. And, and uh, I noticed Home Depot has put in generators for their stores so that when the power goes off, they can still sell things. If you think about it, when the power goes off, where do you need to go to get things? If there's, a, if there's an earthquake, if there's a tornado, if there's a hurricane that shuts down power, you want to go to Home Depot. You want to go to Home Depot and, and buy a generator. You want to go to Home Depot and, and buy uh, wood to repair your house, all of those things. So they actually have a strategy that they have a big generator there ready so that when the power goes off, they can stay open. So um, the so this is the rule, rule two. If two events are independent and success is defined as the probability that at least one of the events will occur, the probability of success is equal to the probability of either one plus one minus the probability multiplied by the other probability. So uh, again, it's math is really hard in words, but we'll, we'll go through this. So a restaurant location in an area had frequent power outages as a generator has a generator to run its refrigeration equipment in case of a power failure. The local power company has a reliability of 0.97 and the generator has a reliability of 0.9. The probability that the restaurant will have power is, so you have the probability of power plus one minus the, the probability of power times the probability of power. So, so to, to sort of understand this, so this is the probability that it will work. So that's 0.97. This number is how often it fails. So this is so 3% of the time, 1 minus 0.97 would be 3. So when it fails, you multiply that by this number, and then you add those together. So you went from 97% to 99.7% probability. 
So now let's go to multiple redundancy. So if two or more events are involved, success is defined as the probability that at least one of them occurs. The probability of success is one minus P all fail. So the probability that all will fail. So the math for this is, is you take the probability that any of them will fail. Um, so the failure for each of these is going to be, if this, this, this one fails, it's 1 minus 0.85, so 15% of the time. And then this one is 20% of the time, and this one is 25% of the time. Here's the math here. So it's 1 minus, and then you just multiply the probability of failure across all of these. So here's the example. A student has three calculators. So if you, if, you, if you have really bad calculators, you want to take more than one to the exam. So um, the reliabilities are 85%, 80%, and 75% um, that, that it will work in her exam. So only one of them needs to function to be able to finish the exam. So what is the probability that she will have a functioning calculator to use when taking her exam. So you, you run through this math and it's 99.25% uh, of the time. Now what I would hate in an exam is, you know, I, I punch, punch in the whole problem and then suddenly it fails and I don't get the answer. So you, you can lose, lose time, lose your answer. But uh, that's that's not part of this. So here's an example where you have both series and parallel probability. So the first the first item here is uh, ninety five percent, and it has a backup with point eight. Next one is eighty five with a backup of point seven and a backup of point seven five. So this is it's you can actually calculate this. So we'll we'll go through this. So the first thing is you, you calculate the probabilities. Um, you know, do the math. Uh, point, point 0.95, point 0.8 comes out to be point 0.99. The next one is point 0.85, point 0.8, uh, point 0.75. That comes out to be 99.25. And then you have point 0.97 for, for the other two. And then you would just uh, multiply those all together. And... 0.99 times 0 0.99, 0 0.25 times 0 0.97, and you get a 95% reliability there. So here's reliability over time, and it's called the bathtub curve. And what happens is there's the first part, which is infant mortality. When you first build something, there's going to be some that just, just sort of fail almost immediately. I bought a uh, LED bulb and it was supposed to last 20 years or something like that. I take it home, I plug it in, and within just like 20 minutes it fails. So I took it back and, and that's an example of infant mortality. And, and what companies will do, like the, the lighting company, they'll plug it in and maybe they'll run it for, for five minutes or something, make sure it, it works. But, but this infant mortality, so this part here, this is sort of the, the normal warranty period. So companies know that things are going to fail, so they offer a, a warranty, like a 90-day warranty. And that really covers that infant mortality time. Now, the extended warranty, that's where you... Um, you pay extra. And typically what they'll do on the extended warranty is they will give you an extended warranty out to this point here. So you're paying for this time when there's very few random failures, but very seldom will they give you an extended warranty out here where the things actually start wearing out. So it, it's this is the bath cup curve and we'll go into this a little more detail. So infant mortality, um, it's, it's uh, distribution. The, the mean time between failure can be modeled as a 
negative exponential distribution. So here's the, here's the negative exponential distribution. So mean time between failure, I guess I should, should explain that. Mean time between failure is, is the average time between a failure. And we'll get into that in a little more detail. But so this is this is the first half of the bathtub curve. There's another thing which is called availability, and this is the fraction of the time a piece of equipment is expected to be available for service. So the availability is the MTBF divided by the MTBF plus the mean time to repair. So mean time between failures, mean time to repair. So here's an example. John Q. student uses a laptop at school. His laptop operates 30 weeks on average between failures. It takes 1.5 weeks on average to put his laptop back into service. What's the laptop's availability? So availability is equal to the mean time between failure divided by the mean time between failure plus the mean time to repair. So so the mean time between failure is 30. It takes a week and a half to repair. So it's 30 divided by 31.5. And, and it actually makes sense. So if you add the 30 weeks plus the week and a half to repair, you divide those two numbers out. So the availability is 95%. So as laptop now, if, if that week and a half is the week that, uh, that, that the term papers do, that could be bad. You'd have to borrow a computer to get your term paper done. So here's a summary of today's lecture, product or service design. So you have sources of ideas, uh, legal and ethical considerations, talked about sustainability and, and how customers are demanding that more and more. Product and service life stages. There's some design approaches and tools to designing products and services. And then we talked about the differences between product and service design. We went over re reliability, the reliability rules, the bathtub curve, and availability.